if you ache for truth, goodness, and beauty. If you're hungry for a Christianity with substance and strength. If you long for a faith that's big and bold and biblical and all about Jesus Christ. If you're inspired by the idea of one church that has spanned 20 centuries, 24 time zones, and two hemispheres, enfolding every race, nation, and language, then you're considering Catholicism. Well, here we sit in the Piney Woods at the Secret Compound, and, you know, I've lived here all my life. My guess is that it's a minus 30 degrees right now. Oh. Picture I, us. I'm giving minus 35. I, I, I'm going to just go right on record. Like we were talking before you turn on. I, I hate this time of year. T.S. Eliot was this famous Catholic or Anglo-Catholic poet, you know, in the 1930s and 40s. And he wrote this very famous poem called The Wasteland. And one of most fa- his most famous lines from it is, April is the cruelest. Month. <laughs> right. and, and I'm like, and, and it is because like people said to me when I moved to Michigan, and you want to move out of Michigan. I do. And when I was in, my friends from California go, how do you get through the winters? And I go, I don't mind the winters. You know, the snow falls, it's Christmas. It's, right. you know, the holidays, you know, you go out, you play in the snow and do snow stuff. And it's kind of pretty with the snow on the pines and all that sort of thing. But it gets to be like the end of March, middle of March, the snow is gone. Right. And then there's like six or eight weeks where it's just gray. Right. And there's a wind off the Great Lakes coming down from Canada and it's cold and it's just, it's bleak like this. Canada's main export, icy air. Yeah. And so we're sitting here in the piney woods uh, at the secret compound and and, uh, the wind is blowing through the pines and it's gray and it's bleak. And we should have started a fire. We should have. And it's going to affect, no doubt, <laughs> not only my mood, but the conversation. <laughs> this is going to be, the, dear, dear listeners, you know, somebody out there is going to be listening to this like in August going, right. oh, and it's like, they're so, it's such a Debbie Downer issue. Right. They're just so, and they seem so depressed. It's like they're, yeah. If you, if you hear clunking sounds on the, on the recording here, it's because I just poured more coffee. Yeah. Uh, I and, got my hands around the mug. And you may have fortified the coffee a bit to get you through the... I did. I brought... Well, I brought optional fortification. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So, and we're uh, also watching my dog Finnegan run through the woods, and I'm hoping that he... I may have to, to call him back at some point if he encounters right. Sasquatch or Chukacapa. Well, you can always edit, the, edit that out or or leave it in for color. <laughs> that's you right. Know. That's right. Um, All right. So, in so, this down day, what are we right? talking about? I want to talk about authority. This has been on my mind, the church's authority, on my mind forever since we started. And you've talked about it a little bit, and it really appeals to me that the church has authority in these things. And we've talked about this, but we haven't talked about it in a while. So if you're new to the podcast, you can go back. But we've talked about, you know, in the Protestant world, nobody really has any authority. Um, You can say that your pastor or your elders have authority. But if you don't like what they come up with, you can go to another church where you do like up what they come up with. Uh, and you can pick a thing that you don't like and you can and you can go someplace where they will they will like it. OK, so that has um, that has intrigued me all this time. So I got to thinking about it. In there's a, so let me give some examples of things that I have questions about and the church's authority. When I go to I sit in the confessional with a priest. And I, I confess my sins, and he, in the uh, in persona Christi a phrase I Latin phrase I learned, uh, standing in for for God tells me that I'm forgiven. If he if he says no, I'm not forgiven. Am I not forgiven? Does he have that authority? Is that was did I already come in forgiven, and I'm just finding it out? Okay, here's uh, here's another example, uh, marriage. Okay. A couple gets married, and it turns out later on that their marriage is annulled by the Catholic Church. It didn't meet the standards. It didn't rise up to the standards of the Catholic Church. Is the church, the marriage tribunal or whoever deals with this, are they only discovering what was already true, or are they declaring it to be null? So was the first a person's marriage, was it already null, and they could have just walked away because it was already null? 
It's just that they went and had it sort of uh, secured by, or, or was the marriage not null until it was declared to be null? Another one, is a person a saint if they're not declared a saint? So somebody lives this great life, and uh, we just talked about this young guy who did the uh, uh, Eucharistic miracles thing uh, uh, not too long ago, and there he's on his way to sainthood. When he died, was he already a saint, and are they are just uncovering it, or is he not a saint until they declare him one? So if I was to ask him to intercede for me before he was declared a saint, does God just to work or does, you know, so in other words, it appears to me from the outside that the Catholic Church and God are partnering and that God has given authority, and I've, I've read this all my life, to bind and loose. Does God, has he turned over the keys and said, there you go, whatever you say, that's what we'll do. That's what I'll, I'll go along with it. I'll back you up on this. That's the way it is. Does that make, does this, does this make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. And so I'm trying to keep track in my head. Um, and I think the answer to your answers to your questions are yes, no, yes. Um, mm. So, in other words, of the three instances that oh, you gave, I think they, if I'm tracking, keeping track here, I think the answers to those three questions are are different because I think the circumstances of those three scenarios are different, right. and we'll go through those one at a time. Okay. But let's back up and talk about this notion of the church's authority. Let, let's let, let's kind of take this from from there, from the big picture, the principle, and then move down to the specific cases, okay? Okay. Th- this is a radically, I mean, this is a radically different idea than Protestants have. Oh, man, yeah. Uh, and, and, I, and I remember right after I converted to Catholicism, uh, entered the church, I... I had dinner or met up or something with a friend of mine from my old seminary days mm-hmm. or whatever, Protestant days, who uh, is now a professor, you know, Protestant right. theology professor. And, you know, we had been good friends or I think we still are good friends, but uh, it was like, wow, you know, you, you've now, you know, become a whatever turncoat and become a, you know, crazy Catholic right. or something. Right. and so. He was kind of pressing me to try to, you know, give him an answer for why I had converted. And so we get into this kind of robust, a little bit heated exchange or whatever in terms of throwing back and forth stuff. And I remember at some point in the conversation, I said, you know, because he was trying to press the Bible. God gave us, you know, the Bible. Christ gave us the word and our allegiance is to the word. And I said... Here's the thing is I've come to believe that Christ didn't come to give us a Bible. Right. You said this before. Yeah, I love it. And he's like, what? I said, I think he came to start a church. And he's like, what do you mean? I don't understand the difference. And I said, well, I can't find, I mean, you're, you know, you're the one who's telling me sola scriptura, only what's in the Bible is true. I said, so I can't find anywhere where Jesus says, okay, here's the game plan, guys. Uh, at the Last Supper or something. Tomorrow I'm going to get crucified and the third day I'm going to rise. I'm going to hang around for a while. Then I'm going to go up to heaven. And then as soon as I'm gone, what I want you guys to do is start writing a book. Then what I want you to do is publish the book. And then I want you to, to distribute the book as widely as you can so that everybody can read the book and decide what truth is. Right. Because that's your theory, right? That's that's your operating theory. I, I said, but for somebody whose whole premise is, I only believe things that are in the Bible, where's the Bible in the Bible, so to speak? Right. Where, where is that? Right. And I said, what I do hear him saying is, in the Great Commission, go forth into all nations, baptizing, uh, right. making disciples and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And I'm with you until the end of the age. And I said, I, I think that the clear instruction of scripture is that he commissioned the apostles to go forth and build a church. And in the course of building of the church, the apostles committed some of their teachings to writings, right? Uh, to writing, which then 
has come down to us. But the important thing to remember is that the authority doesn't derive from the writing to the apostle. It derives from the apostle to the writing. Right. Right? Right. And so that from beginning to end, certainly in the New Testament, I would argue maybe in the entire Old Testament and New Testament, it seems God's plan is to create a church, uh, his body on earth that right. has a head and has authority and has these things and and accomplishes his purposes in the world. Right. And is a community that bears his authority. And as I read the New Testament and I see the letters of the apostles and they start exercising that authority that Christ gave them to teach and to instruct and to command and to, you know, do all the things they did, build churches and and empower others, you know, so you see Peter and Paul and the rest of the apostles, uh, in a sense, empowering their protégés who then start churches and so forth, that the whole concept is that that Christ's plan was always to found a church that would have the authority that he gave to the apostles. Mm -hmm. So I say all of that as a principle upon which I would then say, and we'll get more specific here, but yeah, the concept of authority is inherent in the church. And the reason that we have the Bible that we have, particularly the New Testament, is A, the apostles wrote it based on the authority Christ gave them, or apostles and others right. did. But even more important than that, because not every book in there was written by an apostle. So Luke was not an apostle. Right. And, and yet he wrote Luke and Acts. So on what basis are those part of the New Testament? Well, because the church, <laughs> right, right, which are the successors of the apostles, gathered the writings from, from that first generation, right. including, you know, many letters and gospels from many people. And they sifted and sorted through those and determined which of them were apostolic in character and which of them authentically contain the word of God. And the reason that we have the New Testament that we have is because the church gives us the New Testament. They compared it to what they knew was right. What they, yeah, what they knew that had been handed down to them from the apostles and they exercised their authority. So the reason that you have the, you know, whatever 33 books of the New Testament or right is because those books were determined to by the church to be canonical. So the, the Bible doesn't give us the church. The church gives us the Bible because the authority is resident. The apostolic authority is resident of the church. Okay. So now let's get, a little more specific about what that authority included. It obviously included the capacity to transmit Jesus's teaching, right? So the apostles right. hung around with right. Jesus. They heard everything he said, all of the parables, this, that, um, all of the sermons, and then they could go and share that with others. They could do that verbally and, you know, they're preaching and then they could write it down right. in their gospels and letters, Right. So obviously that teaching authority or transmitting Christ's words. But there's another thing, at least, that it included, and that is the authority to, as you said, bind and loose. Now, Jesus says this twice, um, both in the book of Matthew. He sells to Peter that Peter has the, uh, gives Peter the power to bind and loose. What you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth She'll be loosed in heaven. And then a couple of chapters later, he repeats that phrase and he says it to the apostles in general. Now, what does that phrase mean? It's actually a phrase that came from the Jewish rabbis. So it's not a phrase that Jesus invents here. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. And in the Jewish rabbinical culture of the day, the rabbis talked about binding and loosing. And it sounds pretty much like what you say. To bind something is to forbid it. Right. So, for example, in the Jewish community, some people would come and say, well, can we do this or can we do this? Or there's this question, a moral question, a political question, a, you know, a civil question, a question of, you know, family, favor, whatever, right? And you'd come to the rabbi and say, well, you know, can we do this or 
what, what should we do here? These two people want to get married. These two people have a dispute in court. You know, there's a, there's a moral issue. There's an ethical concern. And the rabbi would either bind, say, nope, that's forbidden, you know, under the Torah and the law of God, or he would loose saying that's permitted under the law right. of God. Right? Right. So Jesus comes and he says to the apostles, first to Peter and then to the apostles in general, I give you the power to bind and loose, but that is a power then that has eternal consequences. So what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and what you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, this is interesting because you were asking a moment ago, uh, when the church does those things, in a sense, is the church just recognizing what decision God has already made? Because what he doesn't say is, what is bound in heaven? you may yeah. bind on earth. Yeah. And what is loosed in heaven, you may loose on earth, right? There's a direction to this. This is the other way around. He gives you authority on earth to bind and loose, to forbid and permit, and that that authority, in a sense, will be respected or travels upward. So what authority I give you, in a sense, I delegate to you here that those decisions, for lack of a better word, carry eternal weight. Does that make sense? Yep. So when the church permits or forbids uh, things, that's what that binding and loosing means. Okay. Okay. And that would then have to do obviously with moral, ethical things. It would have to do with behavior, like you mentioned, marriage, sins, all these different kinds of things that the church has that authority on earth, which the rabbis had that authority on earth. But what Jesus was doing is elevating, saying the authority that the rabbis have to say, yeah, you can do this. No, you can't do this. This is, you know, this comports with God's law. Because what you're saying, and, and it's almost kind of Protestant too, which is this notion that there's this eternal word and all I'm doing as the rabbi or as the Protestant pastor is simply interpreting the written word. Yeah, my for roots you, are showing. Right? Yeah. I'm interpreting the word for you and saying, hey, I've scanned the scriptures. And based on my scan of the scriptures, I think that this is permissible or this isn't. And what Jesus says actually goes beyond that, right? I mean, what he says is, you, the, the things that you bind and loose, the things that you permit and forbid here, uh, that, that becomes sort of binding, not only in this life, but in the next. So he, in a sense, is delegating. And, and think about it, you know, Paul talks about how the church is the body of Christ and Christ is the head, right. right? And so with Christ as the head, we are the body and the apostles and the apostolic authority of the church sort of works under the delegated authority, the head of Christ. Right. Does that make sense? It does. It leads to my, to another question. And, and then that, I want to come to your three instances of confession, marriage, and sainthood. Okay. Um, the next question is, who has that authority and how did they get it? And is it passed down from the apostles? And, and who in the Catholic Church then has that authority? Okay, so there are, you know, there are cardinals and bishops and all that, and there are priests. Um, are there various levels of authority? How mm-hmm. does that work? Bishops. Okay. Okay. So in, in Catholicism, the... The apostles were seen as the first bishops, okay? And we've talked about this before, that these, this word bishop is obviously like an English word, right? right? But that the words in Greek, there were Greek words in the New, that are New, New Testament, right? And, and the bishops are, episco- and a, bish- a singular is an episkopos, a plural would be episkopoi, right? right? So the three offices that are mentioned uh, are presbyter, uh, which is a priest or an elder, uh, a de- deacon, which is, um, a, you know, kind of a servant minister, and then episcopoi, which is the highest level, an overseer, it's right. sometimes translated. So the apostles were, in a sense, the first bishops, and they had this episcopal authority, the authority that was given to the apostles. And then what they did is, the, as the apostles went out, Peter, Paul, and all the rest, and they began to plant churches in that first generation, they appointed overseers right. in these churches. So they, in a sense, appointed or commissioned or ordained would be the word ordained underneath them based on their authority more bishops because only bishops can make you know more bishops. bishops right and and amongst the bishops okay so the, the bishops were able to appoint presbyters or priests and deacons mm-hmm. so take your local bishop here in a, in any diocese 
he has the power or the authority to ordain new priests and ordain new bishops. Okay. And those priests and bishops, in a sense, um, operate with his authority delegated to them. Okay. Right? So they are acting in the sacraments in pers- persona Christi, in the person right. of Christ, but the authority to act in persona Christi right. comes from their local bishop. And the bishop can remove that um, authority from them, right? The, the, you know, if a, if a priest is doing bad things or yep. something, right, the bishop can... So now the bishops themselves, okay, let's go, go up this chain. So yep. who's above the bishops? Well, the bishops as successors to the apostles all carry the, in a sense, the authority of the apostles. Okay. But they do under a sort of governance because, right, so you don't have, you know, the 5,000 bishops in the Catholic Church spread around the world, all each of them operating independently as their own bishop. There is, uh, they are under the authority of the primary bishop, which is the, the successor to Peter. So as Peter was the first of the apostles, right. so the successor of Peter in Rome, the Holy Father, the Pope, is the successor of Peter. And he is, in a sense, the first among the bishops. So only the Pope can make a new bishop and only bishops can make priests. Okay. Okay. So a bishop acts with the authority of the apostles and his authority, in a sense, gets kind of subtle here. Uh, it's not that his authority is delegated to him for the Pope, but the, that the Pope ordains him to be a bishop. Right. And the Pope is his supervisor, sort of, in a way. Right. right? right. Um, the Holy Father is not a dictator. They aren't. It, it's not like a corporate structure, right? But that they that that he's sort of the the first among bishops, as Peter was the first among the apostles. Okay, Does that makes sense. Yes, and and then what you look at is the collective writings and teachings and apostolic authority of the bishops throughout the ages handed down, and that's what we have as apostolic tradition. Okay, so the first the first uh, apostles taught this, and then the second bishops taught this, and so on and so forth. And all of those writings, all of those teachings have this sort of accumulated authority. We, we've used the example before that in the same way that you would look at like the United States Supreme Court and they would say, well, we'll go back and look at prior cases because those prior decisions in a sense become uh, precedents and binding. Right. Um, in the same way, the decisions of the bishops over the last 2000 years have a cumulative weight to them. Sure. Right? Sure. So that's where that authority comes from. That makes sense. Yes, it it seems to me then that it's a pretty weighty thing to take on that authority. Oh my gosh! And yeah. that I, I can't imagine somebody wanting to be a bishop, right? And that it also and this is my uh, the thing that I would I, I would almost be a little bit inherently um, suspicious of somebody who wanted, who wanted to, to be a yeah, bishop. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, it also feels like, and this is, okay, this is when the Protestants get together uh, and throw stones at the Catholics. Uh, they say, we say, I have said, you know, this is fertile ground for political intrigue and for uh, abuse of authority and boy, oh boy, you get a guy in there and then, you know, and so in the Protestant churches, the other thing, the other opposite thing has happened and and that's not to say that it it always happens in the Catholic Church. Of course it doesn't. But uh, I'm I'm laboring under the um, I've said this before, like, like almost a year ago. In the movies, mm-hmm. Christians are always portrayed as idiots, mm-hmm. okay, uh, and backwards people and superstitious. Mm-hmm. The Catholics are routinely portrayed as corrupt. Mm-hmm. The, uh, okay. And conniving and scheming and and mean, and the the Protestants, if they're not pastors, are not predict, uh, uh, portrayed that way. They're portrayed as thick and ordinary and dumb. Uh, so I'm laboring under that a little bit. My my tendency is I found myself. I have to check myself. I see a cardinal. Um, I see this guy. Uh, I follow this guy on Instagram, Bishop Barron, mm-hmm. who is all over the place in social media, and I think, is he crooked? And and I, I shouldn't ask that because no that's a, that's fine to ask it I I think Bishop Barron would say you can ask if he's crooked I I think look um okay couple of things uh 
my my answer is when you go, wow, you know, um, this whole system of the Catholic Church, you know, uh, opens itself up for potential intrigue and right. politics and corruption. You go, yeah, sure, yeah, absolutely, it does. And two thousand years of church history shows you that there has been yeah, if, yeah. Uh, intrigue and politics and church yep. politics and corruption. Mm-hmm. In fact, reading the New Testament itself. Right. I mean, so one of the things is, is there were 12 apostles. Right. And one, <laughs> right. one of them was corrupt. Right. Right. Judas. And right. then you read the letters of Paul and the others and, and, and Peter in the New Testament. And they go, they were they were wrestling with conflicts in, sure. in the church in the very first years, the very first generation. Paul was setting these churches up and he'd leave in a year later in Corinth or wherever. Right. G- Galatia was the church is already in turmoil and he was having to write back and instruct people and 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 uh, and uh, correct and rebuke. So, yeah, I, what I would say is it's just not unique. Any human organization, any sure. organization made up of humans is going to be, you know, subject to that. And it isn't like there's there's some, you know, if there was some control group where you say, oh, you know, we're going to set up a church organization that that never has corruption and never has intrigue and everything. Right. Like the Protestant denominations. I right. mean, I can tell you, right. I mean, look at church history on that. The, the, right. the you know, the, the Protestant denominations are full of intrigue and conflict and corruption. So look, any human organization is going to be always be subject to the failings of human beings. Right. I would actually argue that the the Catholic Church's structure is a structure that is resilient enough that right. it has lasted 2,000 years. Right. Right? Whereas with the, on the Protestant side, what you have is endless division. Every right. couple of years, a new denomination has to split off and form, and another right. division and endless division Whereas, yeah, there is a, the, the Catholic Church allows for, I mean, certainly within it, there's going to be conflict and there's going to be arguments and there's going to be debates. And sometimes there's going to be, you know, pretty strident conflicts and there's going to be uh, corrupt uh, bishops and there's going to be all of that stuff. But the, the, the structure of this organization is remarkably resilient because it is literally the oldest, longest existing single contiguous organization on the planet earth in human history. It has lasted 2000 years. Yeah. So as, as, as you know, it's, it's like your, it's like the, the suspension on your Jeep, you know, it can go over all the rocky trails and bump and knock around, but somehow it, it just keeps on, right. Keeps on keeping on. So, so this is proof to me what the, what I think is that the, the the Protestant Church didn't solve anything. No, by, if, by if, breaking off. If it's I well, if if its goal was to uh, create a pure church that has no corruption, total agreement, uh, complete right. harmony, uh, no division. Well, that that didn't last. You know, six months. Well, so so I I think I talked about this maybe a year ago, but it's been a whole year. I can I can barely remember what I had for breakfast. So here I go. Um, I belonged to a large, largish charismatic church many years ago, and it was one of three big, large, charismatic churches in the area. There was an Assemblies of God, and there was another one that was independent, and ours was independent. And everybody knew everybody, and a lot of people, you know, had been had started out in the same churches and whatever. And, but there were disagreements about how things should be, of course. Okay. Spiritual gifts, a big thing in the charismatic church. And so, and so in our church, we knew a little better than the other two. One of them was started by a guy who grew up in the church I attended and he went off and started his own church and there was no authority above him in that church. Okay. And if you didn't like what he was doing, well, you just had to leave. You couldn't, you couldn't right. go to an authority above him. And in our church, we decided that, uh, you know, I was sort of on the inside because I was a, uh, I was a musician and musicians are always uh, bouncing around the inner circle, you know, cir- uh, orbiting around it. And, and so there, there, there we were, it just boiled down to uh, uh, the, you know, the 12 guys in the living room who really knew that, who really right. knew the truth. And it always happens. It all, but they keep, 
fracturing and splintering. That right. church splintered. The other ones splintered. Yeah. There were splinters off those. Right. And that's, and that's sort of the built-in resiliency of, of the Catholic church structure, but also comes with it this sense of, uh, and I think we're going to talk about this in the next episode, the, the sense of my own willingness or obedience to, to be subject to the, the legitimate authority of the church. Right. You know, I hate analogies about church structure to secular or political things because it, it's, it's the first thing comes to mind. Well, it's kind of like a company or it's kind of right. like, a, you know, this, that. So, okay, right. Disclaimer that I hate these analogies and they all break down and it's terrible. Right. In a very limited way, I want to give an analogy to the, the court system, the j- judicial branch mm-hmm. in, in our government which says, okay, I go to my local court and I feel like I go to the judge uh, here at the local court for some right. matter. And if I feel like I wasn't, you know, that didn't right. turn out, you know, I feel like I was un- got an unjust verdict or something, <laughs> then I appeal up to the next level and to the next level and to the next level and so on and so forth. And the appeals process progresses up through the courts until ultimately it lands at the Supreme Court. Right. Yep. And theoretically, if the Supreme Court hears your case, that's it. Then they go and they hear it, and then the nine justices come back and they render a verdict, and then it's it's that's it. Right. It's it's just it. There's nowhere else to go. And at some point now, then I can you know I can uh, start an insurrection or rebel right. or civil war or something. But I go at some point the the system has ex- exhausted itself. And uh, again, I don't, I'm going to be careful. But in the sort of the same way, you go, well, within the Catholic Church, you go, well, there's going to be arguments and there's going to be disputes right. about doctrinal matters and moral matters and ethical matters and church government issues and all that stuff. And ultimately, those things get, you know, work their way up to, you know, the, the great councils right. of bishops or ultimately to the, to the, to the Pope. And, and at the end of the day, you know, we've talked about some of these things, these dogmatic issues, they get decided and then they've been decided. It, it just... They've been decided. Yeah. And that is part of the resiliency of the system, which also puts on us a willingness to sort of recognize that we are part of the body of Christ right. and recognize the binding and loosing authority of the church and right. recognize that at a certain point, you know, the matter has been decided. Right. Right. Uh, there's a old Latin phrase about this uh, that they used to use in the olden days. You know, Rome has spoken. Right. The matter is decided. Right. And, and it's a little bit like saying the Supreme Court has decided it, it's, it's over. So I, I think that that is a resilience instead of each man, you know, there's in the book of Judges in the Old Testament, it says in those days there was no king in Israel and each man did what was right yeah. in his own eyes. Yeah. And I think that's this sort of lack of authority. So I want to get to those three instances sure. yeah. you gave, and I don't want to, I mean, we could do an episode on each of them, but real quick. Right. Okay. The three you asked me were, if you go into the confessional, and right. the priest forgives you, right? Get, you know, pr- r- yeah. pronounces, you know, gives you absolution, right? right? Which is the term. He he absolves you, right, of your of your guilt. Were you already? Was that just like a? Was that just an exercise? Was he rubber show? stamping it? Yeah. yeah. Was he rubber stamping when it already happened? In other words, had Jesus already forgiven me? And if I didn't go to confession, no, it was really, It's just sort of like a, a formality, right? And I think the answer would be no. It's not. A formality. That is the binding and loosing. Because remember, it is a sacrament. So confession, reconciliation, absolution in the Catholic Church is one of the sacraments in the same way that baptism or the Eucharist is. And so just as baptism is not a formality, because someone could argue, well, aren't we all just sort of, you know, I don't know, baptized in our heart? Hasn't God, in a sense, already sort of baptized us? <laughs> and the ceremony is just a sort of formality yeah. that we go through yeah. a rubber stamp. You go, no, the church actually baptizes you. And in that act of baptism or in that act of the Eucharist or the same way with marriage, you say, well, you know, aren't we sort of really married in God's eyes? And I guess we're just going, going through the ceremony. You go, no, right. until you stood up there and said that, and right. Right, you, right. you weren't married. And, and so the, the thing is, is that that is when the, and that's why I think that case is different because it is a sacrament. And in that sacrament, as in all the sacraments, the priest acts in the person of Christ. So he is Christ's representative in right. that confessional. And until he absolves you, you're not absolved. You can't say, well, Jesus already absolved me and I'm just waiting for this guy, Father Bob, to do it. You go, right. no, because when he goes into that confessional, he's not Father Bob. 
He is Christ. And that's right. the place where you go to transact that business. So in that case, that is a, an, a case of the church's authority sacramentally exercising uh, the sacrament of you know confession, penance, absolution. I love that because I've said this before too, but and I, uh, if you want to go to the blog post, I had a 10 things I love about Catholicism. And one of them was that I can know. Yeah. I can know that I'm okay with God. Right. Because essentially God said yes through this man that I talked to in the confessional. And I can go out, as Chesterton said, five minutes old yeah. and all clean. Uh, I can never get that kind of certainty in the Protestant church. You can sit in your car in the parking lot and go on and on to God or, you know, walk in the woods or sit in your room and, and wonder whether God has forgiven you. But right. this is the, it's, again, I would come back to it. It's the same as all the other sacraments. I know when I've been baptized that I have right. been baptized, very regenerated in Christ. I know when I take the Eucharist, I've taken the Eucharist. I know th through the sacrament of matrimony that I am married. Right. I know that when I go to confession, I have been absolved. So that's the first game. The second one you brought up though was marriage. And the question you had was if a somebody goes through a their an annulment process. Well, if there was there if their marriage was and and you find out that your marriage did not meet the standards. Right. Does that mean it didn't meet the standards all along and that your marriage was actually null the whole time? Yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, that's what they're attempting to determine. So, in other words, they aren't just making up a fiction. They're, right. they're, what the marriage tribunal is, is doing in, in ascertaining that is they're really looking into that and saying, was this marriage valid and sacramental? And that's an uh, issue for another you know, episode where we get into all the, the things. But the church has standards as to whether a right. pre previous marriage was a sacramental right. valid marriage. And there's cases many reasons why it may not have been sacramental and valid. Um, and so that is an investigation, a search for truth to determine what the truth there was. Right. Um, and, and so that's not a case of the church just arbitrarily deciding. Right. And when we do an episode about that, we'll talk because there's always the application of pastoral discipline. But, right. but, but, but the principle here is that the church is doing an investigation to determine right. what the truth is. And then the third case you had was the saints and when someone is canonized, right? right? So that is, again, that's not, a, that's not a sacrament. Canonizing somebody is not sacramental. The church there is recognizing and attempting to discern and investigate the truth of the matter. So when someone is declared a saint and being a friend of God, close to God, right? Right. That this person lived an exemplary life, all these standards you would check. Right. And that's why the, the canonization process is so exhaustive. Right. Because you're in a sense try, attempting to determine the, the facts and why it can take years or decades or centuries for someone to be canonized as the church attempts to determine. Now, the question is always going to come at the end of the day, can they prove it? Do they know it? Absolutely. Right. And that's where the church has to some degree an authority to make a final decision. Because again, let's go back to the Supreme Court an analogy, right? Again, I hate those kinds of analogies, but you know, you come to a court and you present evidence. Right. And the, the, the court decides theoretically and makes a decision based on the preponderance or overwhelming nature right. of the evidence. And, and so when you say Saint so-and-so, um, uh, are they, w w are they really a saint? Are they really, you know, right. with, you know, in the beatific vision, all that you go, well, the church determined to the best of its capacity based on the evidence that it had, that it met those criteria. And then the church exercised its okay. authority to bind and loose to make a decision or a declaration just like a judge or a jury would okay. issue a, a verdict right. based on the presentation of the evidence, the church then present, you know, having been presented the evidence, makes right. a decision and that decision becomes binding. So, so, so in the case of a marriage, the, I'm, st I'm still not sure if you've answered my question. In the case of a marriage, just makes, seems like a good one to me. Um, they are they are trying to determine whether that marriage rose to the 
standards, okay? But if they do determine that it rose to the standards, does that mean it didn't all along and that the marriage was never valid? So uh, in the case of a, okay, interesting. In the case of a saint, my mom was a, I refer to my mom well, as a let's saint. Let's back up because you, yeah. you don't sound convinced. On well, the okay. So, so, so it was, I, if my marriage was never valid, mm -hmm. I got married when I was young and then I ended it. And then I, and then the church considers me, if, if a person gets remarried, they're considering, they're considered to be living in adultery. Yeah. Okay. But if the marriage was never valid, then how could they be living in adultery? And if the marriage was never valid and one of the spouses slept with another person, were they, were they committing adultery or was it, or was it something else? Because they were in the marriage, whatever was valid. I know well, I'm, I, yeah, yeah, we're getting in, picking you know, at nits yeah, here, but, picking at nits, but, uh, but look, uh, we're going to have to save this for a separate issue because we're going to get into all what constitutes a valid and invalid marriage. Um, and I, you know, that's going to act, right. that's going to take 20 minutes here, but look, there are standards or criteria that the church applies to this, right? right. Objective standards, right. you know? So for example, again, I don't want to open this can of, I don't know right. what I'm talking about. It's just going to take, you know, right. you burn out another uh, time. Uh, the whole, it should definitely get a whole episode to it. But like, for example, let's suppose that a marriage was uh, contracted under false premises. Right. Right. So one of the people in the marriage uh, yeah. was secretly married to somebody else right, or secretly right, right. or was married under a false name. I'm just coming up with something, right? right. right? Yeah. Like, this isn't my real name. You can call me, you know, yeah. you know Pierre, you know, whatever. And, and so the, the marriage was, was contracted under false premises. Right. And then they lived together for 20 something years and had kids and all this stuff. Right. Right. And then that marriage ends in divorce. And at some you know point in the future, that person wants to get them, you know, the other person right. wants to get the marriage demolished or whatever. They go back and they go, well, we looked into it. And it turns out that that first person that you lived with for 20 something right. years, it was all a lie. It right. was all based under false, you know premises or whatever, right. it was never valid. It may have felt valid at the time, but it was never valid, which means that, that you were never in a sense sacramentally married, married, and there's no case of adultery to marry again. Now, right. again, we're going to, we should just dedicate a whole issue, right. episode of this because it takes 30, 40 minutes to talk about it. But that, that would be a case where the, the church is attempting to ascertain the truth of the thing. Right. And when they determine that the prior marriage, and that's determined by a tribunal who, who right. like, you know, investigates it and they render in a sense, a verdict and say, okay. yes, that first marriage was either invalid right, or it was valid, in which case you are still married. Right. And that can be a hard thing. And that's why we should take a whole episode to it because there's all these criteria sure. that are applied to, sure. to make that decision. So can I ask my mother to intercede for me? Or does she have to be, is she unable to do that until the church recognizes her as a saint? Which well, they should, by the way. Well, right. I mean, look, uh, what I would say is that scripture makes it pretty clear that all Christians who, you know, die in the Lord are with the Lord and live in the Lord, mm -hmm. right? Whether they have been declared a saint of the Catholic church or not. Right, right. And, and I, and I, I think what the church says with the saints is that we have, in a sense, validated the circumstances of these people. So in other words, I might say, hey, my Aunt Betty seemed like a wonderful Christian lady, and I'm right. sure she's with the Lord. I mean, because she was right. so good. She right, never right, right. missed church. She was so nice to the homeless people. I'm sure she's with the Lord. She really loved Jesus. But I'm still making a subjective judgment. Whereas if it's Saint Betty, the right. church has determined beyond doubt and pronounced that. So I can with confidence. Yeah, you're on secure ground then. You're on solid ground. And why would you, why would I want to ask my mother to intercede for me when I could ask somebody who I knew? You know, I, I feel a little like Father Guido Sarducci when on Saturday Night Live when he asked about getting um, last rites that you needed on the day that you died, but they, the, she was on a ship that crossed the international fate line, right? Is, I, I, yeah. I don't, I don't mean to, yeah, we'll, I don't we'll, mean to be we'll, that we'll have to, we'll have to, no, I mean, these are good questions. I, I think that you kind of open up three questions. Each should probably be their own episode. Um, and, and, uh, about, I would love to do that about yeah. the uh, confession and, and, uh, validity of marriages and then the nature of the saints. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I 
but I think with respect to the initial question today of the authority of the church, yeah, right. that's it. I would say that in the case of the the confessional, the church is exercising its apostolic right. authority. I love that. In the case of uh, a marriage tribunal, the, they are investigating right. the truth of the matter. Right. And in the case of something like that with the saints or a canonization process, they investigate and finally uh, exercise their authority to declare uh, something. So be- next up, we are going to take a break and record another podcast. Here. We are. And I brought cookies from McDonald's oh, yeah. because where else? Where else? Uh, for me. Uh, we, we're going to talk about whether or not I have to pay attention to this. Well, that's the thing is uh, we're going to talk about being subject to the authority, right? Right. Am I going to obey and subject myself to the authority of the church when it tells me to do something I don't want to do? Right. That's all very non-Protestant. Yeah. That's what we'll talk about next. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for listening. My name is Greg Smith. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, would you please hit the like and subscribe buttons wherever you get your podcasts? And please share it with others. And if you're curious about the Catholic worldview and faith, the Church and its Saints, or Catholic history, culture, and art, then visit consideringcatholicism.com. And email me to let me know what you think. Greg at consideringcatholicism.com.